Oh, it's a cloud. Lovely. Okay. Can everybody see thy screen? Shout up if you can't. If I'll oh, so. yeah, I'll assume everybody can. Perfect. So yeah, welcome to the the managing the deteriorating patient in a ward situation. Um, I'm going to do the first bit and then I'm going to hand over to Lorna. So first of all, let's just run through what our aims of the session are. So basically, identifying the deteriorating patient. Um, thinking about physiotherapy amenable and not just physiotherapy problems, but other, other problems that we can also influence. Thinking about clinically reasoning potential um, and appropriate physio interventions, um, and also non-physiotherapy management for a deteriorating patient, patient. And also probably most importantly is sort of how we liaise with other members of the MDT to sort of work together really to enhance patient care. So first of all, how do we identify a deteriorating patients? So what, what tools do we use? So probably the first one is, is the news, isn't it? So news two, which is the what we use at the moment. Um, multi-system assessment, which people will be familiar with, certainly if they've worked within respiratory areas or sort of looking back to when they were a student, in which we're going to do a little bit of a refresher session on. Um, and sort of what we call the end of the bedogram. So sort of standing at the end of the bed and just getting a bit of a feel for what your patient looks like. And actually that can tell you quite a lot. Um, and then there's obviously a whole host of other resources, sort of just blood results, chest x-rays, medications, things like that. So what's the news? We all know what the news is. So we'll just quickly skim over this. So we all know we've seen this many times in various different formats, haven't we? Obviously we're all digital now. So we've got a nice colour coding. Um, everyone's familiar with that, so we don't need to go through that. And obviously the important thing about the news too is actually it now includes the sort of the different scale of scoring for stats, doesn't it, for your COPD patients. And then the next one here is just about sort of how often people should be doing um, observations and recording the news. Yeah, if you want to have a look at this as well, this is just, um, if you go on the intranet, on the critical, if you type in critical care outreach or news, um, there's a section, a whole host, whole section on news about guidelines and all sorts of stuff. So if you're interested, um, so multi system. So most people will be familiar with the elements of multi system, but we'll just we're just going to run through that because that will help us um, in managing our patients and sort of. Um, clinically reasoning what's happening. So a multi-system is a systematic approach to assessing a patient and it's to help us pull all the information together and to facilitate thinking and analysis of our findings and our clinical reasoning. Okay, so what, what do we look at? We're looking at things, we're looking at our observations, are they high, are they low? What's the trends over time? Um, what's normal for the patient and is, is what how they're presenting different to that and starting to consider what's driving a change whether some, if something has changed outside the normal um, normal parameters and is there any influence of medication as well and probably the main thing I always say to people is your multi-system assessment is almost lots of different pieces of the puzzle um, and actually you can't really sort of see the bigger picture um, without putting all the different pieces of the puzzle together. So, you know, for example, you're not going to understand what's going on if you're only looking at um, the cardiovascular system or you're only looking at the respiratory system or you're only looking at elements of each system. You sort of need all the pieces of the puzzle really to, to give you a clearer picture and to help you understand what's going on a bit better. So we'll quickly just run through each system and point out a few key points really about sort of things to look for. So I'm not going to run through normal ranges of things and sort of, you, you know, what's abnormal and, and what's normal. Um, but probably a few key points about um, our sort of cardiovascular system is that actually, you know, blood pressure, if someone's got a particularly low blood pressure, um, actually, that's maybe quite a sort of late response to someone being unwell. So actually, if someone's on a ward and has sort of dropped their blood pressure significantly, probably at that point, they're quite unwell. Um, and similarly, sort of 
um heart rate obviously you know looking at someone with a high heart rate um you know what's driving that actually are they agitated um are they in pain is there something else going on um and again just a little note on temperature just bear in mind if they're on paracetamol or not because we know that paracetamol can drop um reduce temperature by at least a degree um so that might just be masking something else that's going on um, sort of your neuro um, central nervous system stuff. So obviously what we wanted to be looking at here is, you know, what, what is their, what is their GCS? Um, and they look at the, um, is it at the AVPU, don't they? So alert, alert, voice, pain un, um, and unresponsive. Um, you know, can they follow commands? This is going to be really important when it comes to your um, sort of treatment plan. And probably the, the, the key points again from seeing a patient on the ward is that if they've significantly deteriorated from a um, sort of alertness and arousal point of view, actually, that's probably a sign that someone has deteriorated um, and how that might impact on us just written in red there. So, you know, it's going to it's going to it's going to affect someone's ability to maintain their airway, clear secretions um, effectively and engage with, with engage with interventions. It's quite a big one, really. Renal, probably one that maybe um, we sort of leave leave really to last and maybe don't appreciate how important looking at the renal system is. A little bit tricky on the ward compared to ICU because we probably don't always have a sort of an accurate fluid balance like we do on ICU for, for a lot of our patients. So probably the main thing about um, sort of checking the, the renal status and the fluid balance status of someone on a ward is probably just doing a bit more of a gross assessment. So checking for signs of edema, checking hands, checking feet, sort of puffiness, um, checking mucous membranes, dry lips, dry tongue, sort of checking for the status of hydration for them. Um, and actually just trying to unpick what is their overall fluid balance looking like. And actually, you know, if they've got a particularly puffy, if they look, look particularly puffy and fluid <laughs> overloaded, could that be adding to the clinical picture? And often um, sort of medical staff and nurses often sort of confuse secretion load, don't they, for um, for fluid fluid overload and sort of pulmonary edema. So again, it's definitely worth analysing your sort of your renal and your fluid balance um, in a little bit more detail if you can do, um, just to try and unpick and, and put the pieces of the puzzle together, together a bit more. And then before we move on to our respiratory system, we've just got sort of the GI abdo to consider. Um, and again, a little bit tricky on the wall when you've not got sort of everything filled in nicely in front of you like you would do on ICU. So um, the main points really for this are, you know, have they opened the bowels and bowels and what's their abdomen like? You know, actually, often we do find that sort of large distended abdomens um, really cause problems um, in terms of um, thoracic expansion and impacting on on um, our respiratory pattern so just just worth having a look again don't don't forget about that so make sure you've covered everything and then finally just moving on to respiratory which is obviously sort of our bread and butter really so um look listen feel so you know we need to look at every aspect again end of the bedogram stand back have a look see what their respiratory patterns like you know observe the work of breathing um you know can you see one one side that's moving more than the other are they using their accessory muscles are, are they abdominal breathing you know have they got a, an altered pattern of, pattern of breathing um again auscultation we all know we all know to auscultate don't we and i think again this comes back to sort of the pieces of the puzzle you know, we need auscultation won't won't tell us everything, but it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle. So um, have a look, have a listen, get your hands on, have a feel. Can you feel any tactile fremitus? Um, you know, can you feel less uh, thoracic expansion on one side compared to the other? And again, if they can, what's the cough like? Um, you know, what's it like from a strength perspective? Um, is it productive? Is it non-productive? Is it dry? Is it does it sound like there's stuff there? Is it loose? Is it sticky? Is it thick? Um, and then respiratory rate. So we talked about sort of work of breathing and pattern of breathing. Respiratory rate. What we would say is on a ward, don't always take 
for um, face value sort of what was the last sobs written on the news chart you know if you're in, if you're ever in doubt just count it yourself often it's not that accurate um, and certainly if you've been called to the patient acutely stand and just time it yourself um, what's their target sats and are they requiring any supplementary oxygen and again sort of how much oxygen are they on what what sort of oxygenation are they are they receiving um, and just sort of identifying again about if if they're a COPD patient, if, if, if we know that they're a ret retainer, are they on the appropriate oxygen therapy? Do we need to, um, to change that to something of a fixed concentration? Um, and then again, briefly here, just some, some of, the, some of the, the things that could cause a rapid or a gradual deterioration, just to keep in the back of your mind, because actually the speed of someone's deterioration will often um, help you reason what might be the underlying cause. And then a couple of other things, whoops, can I go back? Yeah, a couple of other things um, sort of aside from the multi-system that just come in extra, um, certainly for the ward is an ABG, you're not always gonna have get a gas on the ward. Um, obviously without um, arterial lines on ICU, you know, they don't always do peripheral stabs on people. And actually I think probably it's for us to help guide whether we think that's appropriate or not. And actually, you know, will it change the management? If someone's got really low SATs and you can tell that from putting a SATs probe on them, you probably don't need an ABG to tell you that they're hypoxic and they've got a low PO2. Whereas actually, if you've got someone that you, you think um, you maybe can't get a SATs reading on properly or actually they're presenting like they're quite drowsy and knocked off, potentially in that instance, an ABG might add value actually to look at the CO2, for instance, or if you wanted to see whether someone's... Um, you know, gone into type two respiratory failure, you know, if it's, if you think it's going to add, add value and potentially change the management, then it's definitely worth sort of pushing for, but not in all the circumstances. Same with the, same with the chest x-ray. Again, it's another piece of the puzzle. Um, you'd like to think that if someone's deteriorated, they probably would have had um, a chest x-ray, but not always. Um, and again, often it's sort of used um in our decision making isn't it around treatment certainly with positive pressure we always like to have a an up-to-date chest x-ray so again up-to-date chest x-ray if if we can um, and blood results again um likely on the ward it, it might be that someone doesn't have bloods every day but certainly if they've had recent bloods is just taking a little look at um certainly for us the infection markers in the first instance just to give a bit of a picture of is this infective? You know, if you're sort of trying to debate whether it's infective versus fluid, for instance, um, again, another piece of the puzzle. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Lorna. Um, I'm just going to carry on doing the clicking and she's just going to talk us through um, the first case study. I'm just going to grab my notes. Will that thing move? This yellow box. It's just keeps flashing up. Please move this window away from the shared application. Molly, did you want to say something before I start? Yeah, sorry. I know you um, skimmed over the, the news at the start, um, <laughs> but I've not actually been in work since the end of September and I've not seen that. Um, just the chain, I've not heard of the news two thing with the um, CO2. I've, um, it's, it's just a bit of a national update, so it, all like the news score or used across the country. What they've what changed is, um, um, I'll just, just hang on a second. You, you need to I'm just going to see if I can. Um, they've added in different scores for oxygen and SATs depending on whether somebody is. Um, on a sort of lower target stats because obviously if you've got somebody who's got targets that's late to 92 then they're always going to score and, and you would use the other scoring for that so they won't always score does that make sense oh yeah that's great they've finally done that then brilliant yeah <laughs> <laughs> so they, so they, you can find my that they have a patient that all they need to four, but it's because of the COPD yeah all oh, right brilliant okay. thank you Right, we'll just overcome some technical problems. Yeah, I was just muting myself. 
I think your volume needs to go down as well. That's what I've done. Uh, turn mine down. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm going to talk through a case study um, of a patient on a ward. This is loosely based on somebody I was called out to who was deteriorating um, as I was treating them. And I thought that's a really good example to share with people. Um, so the scenario is that you called out to somebody who, because of increasing oxygen requirements, increasing work of breathing and reduced SATs. I then, didn't turn my, volume, my microphone off actually, should I? Hold on a sec. Yeah, <laughs> right. There you go. Sorry, Rihanna. It is. It was very echo. We've sorted it now. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So you've been called to this patient because their new chest X-ray has shown a white out on the left. Um, it's a 95 year old man on an elderly ward um, admitted four days ago. Um, generally unwell and treated as CAP. Um, the symptoms initially weren't sort of specifically respiratory. Um, got a history of ischemic heart disease, hypertension, he's deaf and has bilateral cataracts. The ceiling of care has been established as ward-based care and he's not for, um, he's not for CPR. Um, not known to the physio team. Um, we've next got a um, chart with his observations. We'll just try and move this. We've got this funny box that's now obscuring some of the important information. Um, and I don't know, we don't know how to get rid of it. It wouldn't be the same without some sort of technical difficulty. Um, so what you've got here is the last three sets of observations and the ones highlighted are his most recent. And if you look at the score, he's, I mean, he was scoring high to begin with at a nine and um it it's crept up really and is now scoring a 14 um you'd notice his oxygen has gone up and his sats have actually gone down he's now starting to spike a temperature and he's got a higher heart rate which you know that's been climbing so he's scoring more on that than he has done um blood pressure is okay um respiratory rates also um gone up and whereas he was confused earlier on he's now only responding to pain so um less responsive than um previously um on your assessment you find that he's propped up sitting up in bed um although not responsive um increased work of breathing looks like he's working incredibly hard really apical pattern um but it, only really responding to a sort of painful stimuli um on auscultation, he's got breath sounds throughout, and despite this white out on the left, there is some breath sounds, but they are just quieter than um, than on the right. Palpation shows that he's got reduced expansion on that left side, um, and the X-ray um, was sort of very clearly a, um, a left-sided collapse with some deviation of his trachea and his heart pulled across. Um, the bloods that have been done. Um, show that his white cells have gone up, they're now 21, his platelets are 378 and his HB is 76. Um, I mean, this particular patient, there were, um, there'd been a problem with, he'd reacted to a transfusion, so he hadn't had further transfusions. Um, so unfortunately that wasn't treated. Um, you then notice as you're starting to assess him and um, that if his oxygen is moved for, for a very short periods, he's dropping his SATs um, and his, his breathing pattern worsens. So summarised the problems here. Um, looks like he's got loss of volume, obviously on his X-ray, likely um, plugged off um, related to his um, cap that he's been treated for. He's subsequently got reduced oxygenation. His oxygen requirements have gone up. Um, and his sats are still no better. Um, work of breathing is much higher and likely secondary to both of those above. Um, is desaturating with in interventions and his consciousness is worsening. Um, in terms of some potential interventions, so initially, um, 
the first thing we would usually try is some sort of positioning. So we could consider trying left side lying, or we might find that actually we're happy with him in high sitting. He was sat well up and um, and pretty well positioned. Um, but if we wanted to really target that left side, and particularly if we're thinking about using some positive pressure, it would be more effective to get him onto his left. Um, so we can try some manual techniques first and some suction, see if we can clear anything. He wasn't really sounding rattly and um, like there was any sort of loose secretions that were going to clear very easily. So a few shakes might get something moving and then a suction. Um, could consider clear way. Um, as I said, I'm basing this on somebody I was called to and I did think about that afterwards. And But at the, at the time I saw him, it was very much this end of the bedogram where looking at this patient there was no way he was going to tolerate um, a clear way so it was something I kind of thought about could I have done that afterwards but it really he, it wouldn't have been successful with him because of his respiratory rate he was um, when I suctioned him taking his oxygen off to do that he dropped into the 80 like low 80s um, so it, it wouldn't really have um, been safe to do so. And actually I got this feeling, he just looked like he was getting worse when I when I did something with him. So when I suctioned him, his breathing pattern looked like it got much worse as well as him desaturating. And I honestly thought this man could die on me. Um, so that's not somebody you normally want to be clear way in. Um, but in a, in a different scenario, sort of you not, seeing that patient and sort of reading this information about the case study you you probably would think about whether you can clear away and use some positive pressure um another intervention that we we can do is titrate his oxygen so get him on a non-rebreathe um to try and achieve his target sats um really important with this patient to think about what the escalation plan is so and you know what what can be done and what um, what other investigations might we want? So we've got a recent chest X-ray which has shown that we've you know, confirmed what we're treating. Um, he's dropped his um, GCS over time. We know that his work of breathing's um, gone up. Uh, you know, could he be retaining CO two? Would it be worth doing a gas? Um, it would certainly tell us more information, but would um, it would be a conversation to perhaps have with the medical team about would it um, would it add anything in this case? And um, as they weren't going to take this patient to um, ARCU or HDU and uh, treat with non-invasive ventilation, um, it, we may not have been able to change our management um, with that information. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we've got a bit of an action plan. So we could, so we talked about repositioning, increasing his oxygen, treating with manual techniques. Um, obviously, we is his HB is very low. Um, with this patient, I actually did a trial suction um, to assess for his cough, which was non-existent and um, secretion load, managed to clear what was probably sort of stuff from the back of his throat, um, but nothing really. Um, I think I might have done a couple of suctions um, and didn't really change anything in terms of his auscultation, didn't really clear any secretions, um, but got this feeling that it was going, it was made worse with, um, with doing that intervention and um, although we might consider using clear way in this instance, I didn't feel it was appropriate. Um, should he have that ABG done? Um, certainly a discussion to have. I mean, it, it wouldn't necessarily, you know, it wouldn't be our decision on our own to be saying, well, you know, we're not gonna do an ABG because we're not gonna escalate things. Um, in this instance, I really got the feeling that this patient was approaching end of life and perhaps an ABG wouldn't have been the nicest procedure for somebody to go through at that point in time, particularly if it wasn't going to change anything. Um, I'd have probably viewed that different. I would have viewed that differently if I felt that um, he was more stable, really. Um, 
Discuss concerns with the medical and nursing team. So you know, really important to highlight to somebody. I've done what I feel I can, but I'm worried that intervention is making this person worse. He looks like he's deteriorating. Do we need to come up with a plan? We have also written on there, discuss nebulizers. If we if we feel that we can change something, can we try some nebulizers to um, loosen any secretions? Um, it kind of depends on which direction the the um, treatment's going, really. Um, but certainly having those discussions. Um, with the rest of the MDT to kind of escalate the management um because you can often get to a point with a deteriorating patient where you've done what you feel you're able to but um you you know they're they're not completely better but you feel that you're at the end of what you can do and I think it, it's important to highlight what you have done but say and I'm now concerned about x y and z and in this case it was, I've done a suction I've done you know I've done some treatment I've tried to clear secretions which I've been unable to I don't feel I can escalate my treatment any further um I'm concerned that this person is deteriorating can we discuss the plan going forward the other thing to bear in mind if we were thinking of using something like the Clearway is um, risk assessing the environment that the patient's in for you uh, for using that. So we'll come on to that a little bit um, later on in the presentation. Um, we've got another case study to discuss next, but if anyone wants to ask any questions about this particular case before we move on, or if any, yeah. So, Eleanor, you've, have you got a hand up there? No, that's my, sorry, my mouse was was making a hand over your name. Um, if anyone has anything they'd like to add, I mean, if anyone has any slightly different opinions about that case, it would be interesting to hear. So stick your hand up or shout out if uh, anyone wants to share any thoughts. We'll uh, move on to the... Just Next case study. So I will just mute myself and turn the speakers off. Yeah. A slightly Pass different. Button. Yeah. A slightly <laughs> different ask? case sorry. study. Oh, Rachel Liv. Sorry to sorry to interrupt. Um, just before you move on. Sorry, it takes me ages to second. get my mind sorted. Laura, can you turn your volume up? Because I can't get out on screen sharing. Yeah. My um my team just wanted to know what the outcome was with the patient. All we needed. I don't know if they can hear us. Oh. Should I type it in the chat? Yeah. 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 Um, the next case study then isn't um no I don't need your volume on um is a slightly um slightly different case study in that it's not a real case study in complete truth although it is a, a sort of an adaptation from a, a recent patient that somebody's seen um but I just thought it'd be a nice one a slightly different um in terms of a, pa a patient that is for escalation um and with sort of yeah slightly different presentation um so this patient you called to see them on the ward you're told that they've got audible secretions um, and they're unable to clear them they've got increase in oxygen requirements and struggling to meet their target sats they are a, a 66 year old male who has been admitted um following a new stroke with seizures um and yeah, past medical history, hypertension, gout, and OA. So, you know, fairly, fairly fit and well um, in terms of probably some of the comorbidities that some of our patients have. Um, and actually this chap is for full escalation. Um, it's been decided that he's for CPR um, and for full, full escalation to ICU. Um, he's been seen by the physios in the day um, and he's presenting with new upper and lower limb um, right sided weakness and he had a GCS of 15 that was documented on the previous physio assessment. Um, this evening he suffered another seizure at about 6.30 um, and seemingly dropped his GCS. 
Um, so he's dropped his GCS to nine. Um, he's now not obeying um, or he's only uh, sort of localising to pain. Um, and now the patient's presenting in a post-ictal state following the seizure um, with a reduced GCS. Um, so I suppose the, the key things to pick out about this patient that we already know are actually this patient is for escalation. So already it sort of starts to make you think about what, you know, if you get there, what are the potential um, interventions and what, what's the potential pathway for this patient if they needed it? Um, and actually, again, we've seen that this patient was GCS 15 um, during the day. And actually, we already know that he's dropped his GCS quite significantly. So we're probably looking at sort of quite a, a, a quick, a rapid deterioration, whereas Lorna's patient sort of seemed to deteriorate maybe over a number of hours. So we've just got another set of OBS. So um, some OBS from earlier on in the day, lunchtime, half past four, um, some OBS from um, 6.40, which were just after he had his seizure at um, half past six. So we've gone from a sort of news of one in the day to a news of eight following his seizure. So post-seizure, we've become a little bit more tachycardic, um, holding our own with regards to our SATs. Um, and sort of, he's, he's still, he's still, you know, um, he's not completely unresponsive. He's um, responding to voice. Um, a little bit more tachypneic, our respiratory rate's gone up a little bit. And then they've called you and the last set of OBS that were done before you arrive are the ones at 8.35. So we can see that his news has got worse. So he's jumped from an eight to a 13. Um, he's now tachycardic. He's actually um, got SATs of 90. So he's using him for SATs of 90. This is a gentleman that's aiming normal SATs. So um, on that new scale, him, he'll need 96 and above not to score anything. So he's scoring a three. Um, and he's actually sat on six litres of um, oxygen via a face mask and he's unresponsive. And he's tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 28. Um, so probably that sort of confirms, doesn't it, that actually he's had a fairly rapid de deterioration. And, you know, when we say rapid, it's over an, a number of hours rather than days, isn't it? Um, you've sort of got worse within the space of a couple of hours there. Probably that obviously we can tell that he's got a lot of abnormal, out of range um, observations there. But probably one of the main things that I'm picking out is as a sort of a physio being called to someone because they've deteriorated from a chest point of view is, the tachypneic, they're not meeting their oxygen requirements. Naturally, they're sat on dry oxygen, aren't they? So um, they're sat on six litres via a face mask, which isn't going to do anybody any good. So that's probably the, the first things that I can pick out from that. What do you notice? There we go. Um, so when I get there, again, a bit of an end of the bedogram. He's slumped in the bed. He's got pretty noisy breathing. I can hear um, audible sort of secretions. He's got what looks like sort of that seesaw breathing. Um, he's using it as accessory muscles. I've had a listen um, and he does have air entry throughout and with his upper zones um, with some quite harsh sounding crackles, which possibly might be um, transmitted sort of from his, his, his main airway. So it's, it's bilateral and it's sort of at the same um, point in the breath wherever I'm putting my stethoscope. Um, He's got reduced air entry bilaterally and possibly is that because he's sort of got that more rapid, shallow breathing pattern and he's sort of using his accessory muscles. He's had, they've, they've done a good job and they've done a chest x-ray sort of as he's deteriorated um, with him going up on his oxygen. And actually there isn't anything particularly significant on his chest x-ray um, compared to one that he's had previously, just some reduced um, volume at his left base. And actually probably this man's deteriorated over the last hour or so and actually it might be that nothing's really showing up on his chest x-ray yet is probably what I will say and um, again chest x-ray is just one of the small pieces of the puzzle isn't it so um, it just adds to everything really. Um, one of the significant things about this patient is he's now obviously extremely knocked off um, and got a low level of arousal and actually He's, he's really pooling um, his saliva in his mouth and it's almost 
pouring out you know drooling out of his mouth he's, he's not managing his oral secretions at all he's not you know he's not managing his airway um, and actually this is this is pretty concerning really this man sat in a ward um area and currently probably not not maintaining his is his, his, his sort of his airway really um or protecting his airway should i say um he's only eye opening to pain he's definitely not following commands um, so I'm, I'm quite concerned, really, that probably because of his reduction in, in GCS is in his, his quick deterioration. Um, he's now probably not managing in, in protecting his airway. He's probably aspirating on oral secretions um, and he's certainly not able to cough and clear independently. And actually, he looks like he's, he's sort of deteriorating pretty quickly, really, here. Um, and already I'm starting to think about the fact that this gentleman is for full escalation and starting to think about maybe who, who I need to get involved at this stage um, if they're not already. So just to try and sort of summarise and get sort of what the main problems really are for this patient clear in my mind, um, a little bit of a problem list. So we've said already, retain secretions, which you, we know because we've listened We've, we've popped our hands on, we can feel it just from standing at the end of the bed, we can hear he's got noisy breathing, we can hear sort of audible upper airway secretions, we can see he's got pooling of saliva in his mouth. Um, reduced oxygenation, he's only got sats of 90, they've had to go up to six litres on oxygen. Um, reduced GCS, increased work of breathing and he's in a bit of a rubbish position in the bed. So starting to think about maybe what's in our treatment toolbox, Retain secretions, we could think about some suctioning, couldn't we? So um, MPOP suction, again, a little bit similar to Lorna's patient. We could think about adding in the clearway or assessing to see how far we get with the clearway. Um, and again, adding in manual techniques, sort of bibs and things if we needed to sort of do that in addition to any suctioning. We need to sort out this man's oxygen, don't we? So can we put him on something um, a little bit better on the ward so we've got um we've got the cold water humidified circuits haven't we so the recipe flows um again i know there's probably a little bit of uncertainty about wards letting you use different bits of oxygen kit from an aerosol generating point of view at the moment so depending on what ward you're working on obviously that has to be risk assessed for that particular patient but certainly he's going to need something more controlled um oxygen um percentage isn't he so whether or not he can go on to some sort of venturi system or even better like i say something that's humidified um depending on what ward this gentleman's sitting on or even better rather than cold humidified kind of go on to some sort of warmer humidified certainly if he's getting a higher flow of oxygen um because that high flow higher flow of oxygen is certainly going to just start to dry 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 him up is it isn't dry up dry him up if he stays on it for an extended length of time um and thinking about repositioning as well so you know what's the best position for this chap to be in possibly just upright in the bed if we can um, or we could potentially think about side lying possibly alternate if we can identify a side where we want to target some sort of postural drainage um, but probably for this chap we'll say upright sitting um, as we're not entirely sure that probably one side's worse than the other um, we're going to switch him to like I say some sort of humidified venturi system but the other tip probably certainly for treating this sort of patient on a ward is you know grab an omri breathe get get an omri breathe from a store cupboard and just have it just have it handy um i've been in many situations where um you know a patient's deteriorated mid treatment mid suctioning or, or whatever or mid rolling and actually you just need that rescue therapy of sort of putting them on something just to sort of pre or post oxygenate or so salvage your situation so um, if you can, if you can, if you've got enough time, just get an on rebreathe. And if, if you don't use it, then then that's fine. But at least you've got the reassurance then. Um, and I haven't put it on here as well, but get an OBS machine. If they're not already got an OBS machine at the outside of the bed, get a pulse oximeter on them. And then you can sort of see live what's going on, which obviously on a ward, we don't always have the luxury of like we do on ICU. But yeah, if you can get an OBS machine and then you can, you can see what you're working with. Um, so with this one, this patient did a trial of an MP suction to assess, A, what's their cough like? Can we simulate a cough? 
what's actually down there and what 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 does it look like or what you know is it thick and sticky or is it quite loose can we clear it what's what's it like um and a little just just a little reminder is which i think as physios we are very very good at is just don't forget to check your clotting um so checking checking your platelets checking your inr checking your hb um just to make sure that obviously before you shove a foreign object up someone's nose that you're, you're confident about their clotting um I did, we did check the clotting for this particular patient, but when we put the MPA away in, um, it was all right. And then we've done a suction and actually on the back of the suction, we've actually suctioned up quite a lot of blood. Um, and obviously a little bit, a little bit scary. Um, sort of wonder whether you've done a bit of damage. Um, and this happens a lot. I think even when people do check the clotting and um, put airways in, do some do it doing mp suction there is sometimes trauma cause and especially if this patient's had ng insertions and things like that so it's it's it is a little bit of a scary situation if anyone's ever been in that situation but i think as long as you're happy that you've checked the clotting and the medical staff are aware i think it's a bit of a risk versus benefit situation and actually if you don't put that mp airway in and or mp suction that patient they're probably going to drown on the secretions anyway so um I think it's it's sort of having that discussion really and coming to that um, risk assess decision really. Um, and again, a little bit similar to Lorna's patient, you know, we've done a couple of MP suctions, we've cleared a little bit, but we're still not convinced that we've got it all. How appropriate at that point is it to start getting a clearway and setting the clearway up um, and trialing them with the clearway? And I think probably um, for this type of patient, you know, how are they responding to your MP suction? Are you having to do massive sort of uh, or long periods of rescuing their um, sats or non, non-rebreathing in between MP suctions? And actually, if at that point, they're saturating into the boots in between MP suctioning, probably at that point, I would say, you know, how appropriate is it to continue to do something like this? And that's probably where you're sort of needing to get other members of the MDT involved quite quickly, really. We've got to remember that this man is for escalation. So hopefully outreach will have already been called. We'll touch on outreach at the end of the presentation, but outreach should have been called as um, they've, they've already triggered from a news perspective. But certainly if the ward haven't done that, get in touch with outreach. Um, because actually this man could be escalated and he could have um, some, some BiPAP or some CPAP, certainly just to um, prevent him from heading towards intubation. Um, and I suppose other things to consider, but again, not completely necessary in a sort of acutely deteriorating on call perspective, but certainly from a management perspective is, you know, if he's sort of not improving from a GCS point of view in the sort of hours to come, do we need to consider adding in something to help just manage his um, dry presoral secretion so maybe some higher sin again that's not going to work instantaneously it's just one of the sort of additional things to think about um, let me just go back to that so yeah I think um, this particular patient um, which like I say is a little bit of a it was a real patient just with other uh, sort of other things added in did end up getting escalated to ICU and intubated um, and actually maintained a very, very low GCS and didn't really improve um, and ended up ended up dying as well. Um, and I think this is just quite a, a, a typical example of someone that deteriorated, deteriorated pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and actually physio did all that they could in terms of managing the acute situation of this person drowning in their secretions. But actually the important thing here was that they were escalated appropriately and um, ended up going to ICU and getting tubed pretty quickly in order to protect and maintain their airway. Um, and I think it's just recognising that, like Lorna said before, we've done everything that we can and then it's sort of passing the baton over appropriately. Um, we'll just move on to some other, um, the next slide. All right. So I've just got a few slides to finish off. Um, so we've talked quite a bit about the physio management that we've had for both of those patients. Um, 
but the important thing with the deteriorating patient is that we're not the only ones managing them it's it's a multidisciplinary approach and um i think sometimes you can come away from situations like perhaps either of those examples and feel like you haven't done very much or that your input wasn't particularly valuable and i would say that any situation where you've been called and somebody's asking for advice and you've been able to add your assessment and advice for that management has been useful in some form. You might not have a, a wonderful x-ray change of, of collapse that you've completely resolved or anything really nice like that to show for it, but um, there may be some subtle things that you've added to that patient's management. And the things listed on this slide about non-physio management for the deteriorating patient is probably nothing new to anybody um, on this call. Um, but it was kind of to highlight some of the additional things that we do and so don't underestimate your own skills and the, the power of um, the physio call out you know, our, our usefulness in those situations. Um, and of course, you're not on your own. So we've got a slide about who you might want to link in with. So um, I know it can be difficult on the ward sometimes um, if the nursing staff are busy, particularly overnight, and there's not very many of them on, but um, sort of keeping the nursing staff involved in what you're doing, which I'm sure everybody uh, naturally does anyway, but they also know the patient really well um, and they can tell you sort of how, um, how they've progressed or deteriorated through the day. Um, being aware of uh, critical outreach and uh, care outreach and escalating to them in appropriate circumstances, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, during the day, you, you know, these patients, um, we do get called to these patients during the day and obviously it's a bit easier when you've got a team to support you. Um, but if you're on a ward outside of respiratory, um, bear in mind that, you know, the respiratory physio team will you know, help you over the phone if you've got quick question you want to ask or if you want to get in touch with myself or Natalie to offer any advice or um, uh, chat through things or if you've got a sort of difficult situation that perhaps you felt you know, it would be useful for us to come and join you we'd be happy to try and do that wherever we're able to. Um, the ICU team might need to be involved um, particularly those patients who um, are es being escalated. If you know that you, your patient is being referred to ICU, if you can be around when they that they come, it's useful to put your um, perspective across to them when they're assessing. Um, if it is out of hours, um, obviously you've got um, other professionals within the hospital, but remember you've also got somebody um, across the other side of the city. And I think it's a resource that we don't particularly use and we don't want to bother the other person, but, um, there are times where it might be helpful to, to phone that person and just say, I've been a bit stuck, you know, stuck with this person. Is there anything else you might have done? Um, so it's worth remembering that that person is also there. Um, in terms of outreach, uh, they are available 24 seven across LGI and Jimmy's. There's two separate teams for Jimmy's, so their contact details are there. Um, any adult inpatient with the news of seven or above should be considered for referral to outreach. Um, but the new scores kind of are like everything else we've talked about, that other piece in, in a puzzle and should be taken into contact with um, how that patient is presenting. So there might be a patient who's scoring five or something, um, but you're really concerned about them. Um, they they can also be referred so you know it's worthwhile asking them for any advice um i've been in touch with them about shadowing which i hadn't um been able to get sorted before doing this training which i'd hoped to but they are um happy to have people shadow and they've got a site on the internet that gives in uh, gives details about that so if you feel that managing the deteriorating patient on a ward um is an area you want to sort of develop a bit more it might be worth having a, a look at their website and ex exploring that and then the other things of linking to that is this aim course the acute illness management course um this has been around for a while it's something that was developed by Man in manchester and the critical care outreach team are now like accredited um uh, uh 
trainers and um, I'm just pasting a link into the chat for the um, web page about that. I, I went on this course in another trust uh, probably about 10 years ago now and it's a it's one day it talks through kind of a systems like an A to E assessment really um, but it, it, I found it really useful to think about how the distant the different systems link and the overall management of a patient. Um, it's not that everybody working out of hours would need to go on it or should go on it, but it might be something that some of you sort of think of as a personal objective. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind that that exists. Um, and then just for just to try and finish off quickly, um, I think one of the most challenging things about managing these patients is obviously the clinical side of things, but um, there's also this feeling that you haven't quite achieved everything you wanted to achieve or um, that you then need to have a conversation with other members of the MDT which might be difficult you might be saying that you that you feel one thing about their assessment and, and feeling that you're going to be met with resistance and I know there's sometimes situations where the medical team are asking for certain um, interventions that might not be appropriate um, so a few sort of pointers about managing those challenging conversations. Um, it's always useful to check the notes, get, you know, it sounds obvious and I'm sure lots of people do this anyway, but make sure you know exactly, you know, you know about that patient, you, you know the decisions that have been made, including the respect form, what's going on with ceilings of care. Um, and, uh, you know, so you've got that information to hand to sort of present a, a sort of clear um, assessment um, and knowledge of that patient. Um, you might have got to know a bit more about the patient or the family's best interest or wishes um, through your intervention. They might have shared something with you that they've not shared with the medical team previously. And sometimes these discussions around ceilings of care and escalation plans can, haven't quite been finalised. Uh, you know, somebody's come in and is deteriorating and, you know, there's further discussions to have you know they might have partly you know, introduced these topics but not fully um explored them and it might be that you're getting extra pieces of information um using the the sbar tool um can be really helpful to um structure your communication so using this um, situation background assessment recommendation and they've updated it recently i think this is off our um respect form and the sort of national SBAR thing is now SBARD. So you've got, after your recommendation, you've got a diagnosis. Um, you don't have to follow that script um, religiously, but you could, um, you can use that to vaguely structure your um, conversation with somebody and that might help sort of get your point across. Um, and I think we've also said, try and support members of the MDT as we'd hope they support you, um, listen to the other person's um, point of view. Um, if you've got a sort of action plan um, from a physio point of view, that's something useful to share. Um, and then lastly, we've just got um, a reference to the respect form here, um, which replaced the DNA, DNA CPR form in um, 2018 to make it a more shared decision and it's not just a black and white decision of are you for resource or not there's um there may be different elements of um escalation of care in, involved in that so it's a it's got a bit more detail and you find that on ppm um so just sort of rushing to the end um if anyone's got any questions now um we can talk through anything thank you for coming um I hope it's been useful. And if nobody's got any questions, or, or if anybody had any um, ideas for future training, we would be interested to know. Um, just pop us an email um, if, if you've got any ideas. Right, thank you. Thank you, everyone.